So the lecture we are, we will hear now is named, it's a little reminder, historical reminder, it's named after Sem Presser, who was one of Netherlands' most famous press photographers and whose career spanned from the 1930s through the 1960s, covering social issues and then the war. And then he turned to portraying great artists of his time. Uh, he relentlessly campaigned for the defense and enforcement of photography, co photography copyrights and he was a pivotal board member of the World Press Photo. For the past 15 years, the World Press Photo has invited highly acclaimed international speakers to give a Sem Presser lecture during the awards days on a subject matter of crucial relevance to the field of photojournalism. And this year we welcome somebody for whom I have huge respect and admiration, as I'm sure this is shared between us, for her extraordinarily poignant images and her relentless work documenting gender and human rights issues in the world. Her career started shortly after graduating from the University of Florida. She was sent to Iraq by the Chicago Tribune to cover the invasion, as well as the ongoing war in Afghanistan. She spent several years based in the Middle East, covering that region, but also South, South Asia. And the more she traveled, the more often she was confronted with the everyday brutality that many young girls face around the world. And it was in Afghanistan that she first encountered the issue of child marriage while working on a story about self-immolation by Afghan women. And this was the start of what is now a 15-year series, Too Young to Wed, which examines the practice of early forced and child marriage as it occurs in various cultures still today. Over the years, the work has been published worldwide and won numerous awards, including three World Press Photo Awards, three Visa d'Or Features Awards in Perpignan, and it has been exhibited, uh, amongst other places, at the United Nations and at the Whitney Biennial. In the same vein, she also photographed a mass circumcision ceremony in Indonesia and young women's life within a polygamic community, the Mormons, in the USA, both of which was first published in the New York Times Magazine. She is a relentless advocate for the rights of young girls. Too Young to Wed is now a nonprofit organization that strives to defend girls' rights and end child marriage. Please welcome Stephanie Sinclair. That was so lovely. <laughs> so much. Oh. Oops. Oops. Let me get my clicker. Um, Thank you all for being here. Um, before I start, um, I just want to say, um, like Kadir mentioned the other day, I, um, I follow uh, in the in the footsteps today for um, with Stanley Green, who gave this gave this talk last year. And um, uh, I just and all of there's so many different um, both men and women photographers who've paved the way throughout the generations um, for the next you know, group to kind of continue, uh, to continue human rights work. And um, I just hope that I'm a small part of kind of, you know, you, you kind of locking on to something and feeling like, you know, how important it is that we stay, stay with things um, until we see change. Oh, okay. So I'm starting this lecture today with um, kind of the person who, who made me, obviously, you know, who I am today is my mother. Her name was Paula Schulte. And my mother was, um, she was a painter and a prolific painter, like compulsively would paint. And, and she did these like realist, realist paintings. And, um, and she really, she, she just, her work ethic was really insane. And she just, she really loved giving back and expressing herself. And, and, um, and one thing that was inspiring to me um, was how much her work defined her, how much value and self-confidence she got from her work. And, um, but, but, and I think that her influence kind of impacted my work in so many different ways. And one of them being is I remember being about 10 years old and my mom, uh, she was a secretary, and then she was a bank teller, and my mom was very beautiful and was really valued for her looks. She was valued because of kind of, you know, just very kind of simple jobs, but really 
you know, was seen as this really beautiful woman, and then she wanted to go to school, and her, back to school, to university, and her family, you know, from the South and in, in the U U.S., and her family didn't support her. My, um, my grandfather, uh, he would go so far as to say things like, who do you think you are going to school? You know, you're, this is not your job, this is not your role. And I remember how heartbroken she was to hear that. And, um, and I remember her going back to school, and she really kind of believed him and believed the, that, that you know, she had just limited potential. But at some point, she was like, you know what, I'm going to go anyway. And my dad happened to be pretty awesome. And so he supported her. And turns out my mom ended up getting straight A's in college. She never got a B, and she got a full scholarship to the University of Miami. Um, and she was in her, like, mid to late you know, 30s when this happened. And so I was young and I was, it had such a profound impact on me. And, and even though she would be, she would work full time uh, and then she would cook for all of us. She still had many of the same traditional roles. She, she cooked for us, she did all the laundry, she did everything. And then she would stay studying till one o'clock in the morning. But I watched it like completely change her life and her, what she thought about herself. And really about how my dad interacted with her. Like all of a sudden he realized he was the, he was the breadwinner and all of a sudden he realized, oh, actually we're, we're equals like, and she might be smarter than me. And, um, and, and, and the respect kind of lasted and he, my dad's a, a very kind man, but the respect lasted even until she was, um, my mom got very ill and was unable to um, achieve her dreams and the career she wanted. But it really impacted the way my dad took care of, like even like, their relationship all the way through her illness. And it was very, it just had a big, profound effect on me. And so it really impacted my work. And so when I wanted to cover, I, you know, after September 11th happened, I wanted to see what was happening. You know, I really wanted to understand the world better. Um, I was in my mid-20s, and, and I just, I obviously realized how much we didn't know about the world. And so I, I lobbied the uh, Chicago Tribune very hard to let me go cover, um, you know, what was happening in Afghanistan and Iraq, and, um, and I found myself really gravitating towards, um, towards a lot of the, the girls in these situations. And this is in Basra, in the, um, and, and they're, you know, this is in, their fighting was still happening, and this, this father is walking his daughter into that. And I remember thinking, you know, I was obviously pretty scared. I was pretty new at all this stuff. And I remember thinking, man, if she can walk into there, like certainly I, ha I should be brave enough to, to tell this story. And um, in, when, it, when certain things got um, more intense. But I found myself um, kind of looking at the, I really was always in conflict situations, I was always gravitating towards the civilian side. What did it look like to be a family? And what did it look like to, to ha have kids or to be, just have this stuff thr thrust on you and not really have, um, you know, and, and not have a lot of resources to handle it. And so these were the types of stories that I really wanted to um, look at. And I found myself also drawn to kind of the humanity and survival instincts and like resiliency of certain communities. And this is actually in Yemen. So I was assigned to cover um, the an assignment for, um, it was actually Marie Claire, and uh, they, they, it was a story about girls who, it was girls who were setting themselves on fire in Afghanistan, but they didn't really know if it was happening, and they wanted me to go see. And um, this was, it was one of those situations where um, this kind of, this story really changed my, what I would do for the next 15 years. And I won't stay on the next picture very long, but it's the one that won in World Press Photo. And this is a girl named Marzia. And Marzia was married when she was 10 years old. And, um, and one of the things that I've, I always tried to do is, even in the midst of very difficult things, is show the humanity and, and things that people could relate. And like the bow in her hair is one of the things that was like, she's still trying to be beautiful in the middle of this. Um, and Marzia and Rakshana here, they both were married very young. And when I would talk to them about what, what was it that, was, and they both, um, Rakshana didn't survive, but, um, but when I would talk to, you know, a lot of the women in the burn ward about why would they do this, they would say things like, well, I broke my husband's television set, or I didn't make the tea hot enough, and it wasn't reasons that were, would make sense for this, and it really showed me that there was something much deeper that was happening, and then I, many of them told me that they were married as children, 
And, um, and so um, this is a woman named Mejgon, and I got a really beautiful letter today um, from someone who said they were impacted by this image and this story, but Mejgon was also one of those people who had like stayed with me through all these years. And she was married at 11. This is in a shelter in Afghanistan, and she was married at 11, and she then was given to her, um, given away in marriage, and was abused and forced into drug trafficking and all kinds of stuff and was constantly beaten. And she told me, in my whole life, I've never felt love. And she was 15 years old. And like, I don't think there's anyone in this room who can say that that's happened to them. Hopefully not. And, but like, what a, what a crime. Like, that in itself is a crime. And um, but she was finally finding the um, support she needed from this organization. It was an Afghan-run nonprofit um, and, uh, and, and they were running this small shelter. But it was at that time I was like, wow, I'm pretty much gonna work on this till, I, till it's no longer a problem. And so um, through, I kept working on this and Afghanistan was kind of where I was, I would do these bits and pieces through other assignments to pay the bills. And so, but in, in between some of this, I was introduced to um, Malalai Kakar and she was an Afghan police officer and, in Kandahar. And actually, I was just in touch with her son this week um, because he's now had death threats and she was eventually killed for her work protecting women in Afghanistan. And, um, but she called me up and she knew I was working on this child marriage story and she was like, she called me up, she's like, you gotta come to the police station right away. And I said, okay, and so I went over there and she, this is a girl named Jamila um, and she had wanted to go visit her husband, I mean her mother without her husband's permission. And, um, and, you know, there was some sort of like power struggle and he ended up trying, this man tried to kill her and, and tried to kill her grandmother who tried to protect her. And so I asked Malala, I said, what's gonna happen to this man now that we have, um, you know, you've got him in jail. Like, you know, we've got him, we've photographed him and she goes, nothing, men are kings here. And so that was, um, and so these are some pretty tough stories and I promise the lecture gets better, but, <laughs> but I wanted to kind of show you that kind of I entered this subject in a very, urgent, you know, with a, very, with a lot of urgency because I was meeting girls who were kind of on the toughest end of this. Um, this is Bibi Aisha. Um, many people have seen her story. Her, she was part of World Press Photo, one of the World Press Photo winners. Um, Jody Bieber photographed her. I photographed her as well. And um, she's now um, has had reconstructive surgery and lives in the U.S. and has been supported. But you know, she was in a shelter here at the time when I met her, and um, she was traded in um, a bot marriage, and she was traded to, um, for uh, someone in her family did something against another family, and she was traded to members of the Taliban to be a wife. And um, when she tried to escape, she was injured, uh, and they cut her nose and her ears off. So clearly I was seeing this very extreme kind of repercussions of child marriage and why, and I was like, okay, well, so I started doing more research on it and I, the more I looked at it, I was like, well, I need to find out what life is like in these marriages. Like what happens that, that makes these, that are kind of, um, that makes girls wanna commit suicide? What, what is it that makes them, you know, just have to endure these things? What does this look like? And so the first instance I had was at, um, was, he, was also in Afghanistan, and I did a series for the New York Times on my own with a, a small grant first. Um, and this is a, a, a girl um, who was, this was her, her engagement date, actually. This isn't the day she was married, but this is the first time she ever saw her husband, her future husband. And, um, and so, um, and the more I looked at this, and, and the reason, I kind of need to back up for one second, the reason why I wanted to really look at this is when you would, at the time, when you would look online and you would look up child marriage, there were a lot of different um, reports. The International Center for Research on Women had a really great report. There were, um, you know, showing that this was, if you, if you let girls get married at very young ages, it makes them, you know, they're taken out of school, they um, give birth too young, they have complications from birth, and all these things that I'll show you in the series. But there were no photographs. And so I think this was one of the first photographs that kind of caught people's attention and started to be able to be an example of, of what, what it can look like, what it can look like. Not always looks like, because this happens in more than 50 countries, including in Western countries, and we'll, and we'll get to that as well. Um, but one thing that's universal, even in my, own, uh, in my own experiences and in my mom's life, is that 
Um, and many, and, you know, women are still valued for their bodies in so many, you know, different ways. They're in, in, and especially in countries that, um, where education for women isn't there, where, isn't where it should be, you know, you still have women valued for their fertility, their, their sexuality, and their labor. And, um, and so that's what we're, that's what we're trying to change. Um, that's what I've been trying to change with this series and why I've stayed on it, because as soon as we can start valuing for women for their, for their, um, their minds and their contributions to society, and if women and girls are educated, then, you know, every part of society will be better. And so this was in India, and this, this community um, is, uh, you know, they, they have also high rates of child marriage, because you see this in areas um, that the highest rates and numbers of child marriage, even though it happens globally, are in some of the most poor rural areas. And in, and in communities, not just cities, but in poor rural com in communities. And so, um, and so that's why, um, you know, so you'll see a lot, of, a lot of that here too. So this is, um, I was able to, I spent many years working on this. And at first my goal was to photograph the weddings because I would meet editors and I would talk to people and they would say, well, child marriage, it doesn't really happen that much anymore. We don't see, you know, and because there was no visual evidence, they just said it wasn't happening. And so this is a girl um, being taken to her wedding, not knowing where she was going. And this is, and this is another instance. I was working on a project, this was for National Geographic, and they said, oh, well, girls don't get married at very young ages anymore. It's usually teenagers. And the, the majority is teenagers. Um, but there are still areas where girls are married, you know, young and sometimes even prepubescent. In this case, her, her groom was also young. He was about nine years old, and this is in India. And this was um, also one of the World Press photo uh, winners, and this is Radha and Tahani. And Tahani is the one in pink, and, and she, um, they didn't quite know their ages, but they thought that maybe they were between eight and 10. And um, she was married, and every sense of the word with her husband. And she, Rada had been just given to this gentleman and, um, and she was still in school. Um, and so what I learned is, um, is that child marriage was, um, there were so many issues that were related to child marriage. And that was one of the reasons why, if I wanted to kind of address all the things that held women around the world back and girls around the world back, I had to, and if we could raise the age of marriage, so many things would improve. And that includes um, female circumcision or cutting or FGM, whichever you want to call it. And so, um, and because a lot of times it's done to prepare girls for marriage. And so, the, in a lot of places, change is happening. And so we do see, this is in Sierra Leone, and this is, um, uh, it's before these two girls are about to get cut. And they did, now they have the, the SOAs in the community are agreeing to try to wait till 18 and let it be uh, a, an adult decision. But then we meet um, the smaller girl who's only 13 who, when it's still happening. So the change is happening, the word is starting to get out, but it just still has a ways to go. And this is a female uh, cutting ceremony in Indonesia. And this is still happening, although I will say that since I did this picture, and I did this in like 2006, um, that the rates of, of uh, cutting uh, and FGM have gone down dramatically. And it's not because of my picture only, because, but I think that when we raise the awareness of, certain, of some of these topics, um, I think it does put pressure, and in ways that I think a lot of us don't always understand. Um, I just found out that one of my pictures was involved in, uh, from Afghanistan, was in, uh, inspired somebody to give um, like a multi-million dollar project to plan international in Spain. So, you know, and, and to deal with some of these issues. So you just don't know all the time what's happening. Um, and then uh, this was a project we did in Guatemala and I wanted to focus on the young mothers there. Um, this is Araceli, she's 14, and her, um, and her baby, she was out of school, her husband left her, and, and I said, what do you want for your future, Araceli? And she said, well, maybe my, maybe my son will take care of me. So this is the type of even mental stunting that, that happens, you know, when you, when you don't have opportunity. And a lot of this um, is clearly about access to education. It's about access, it's economic disparity as well. Um, and, 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 and a lot of times families are also not 
I don't, I don't come from the point of view that families are trying to hurt their children or these co that these communities are inherently bad in any way, shape, or form. There's not a single picture you've just seen that would have been done without a team of like 10 people from the community who believed that this story needed to get out and helped me with every picture that was done. They just knew that, um, or hoped, should I say, that if they could get this out, um, and they were usually probably more educated members of that community who were like, and it, in the case with the little girl being um, carried, the five-year-old um, Rajani being carried over the shoulder, her uncle, who participated in the marriage, was actually the one to get me access. And he was more educated, and he, and it was his own family, but he was like, if we do this, maybe, maybe there will be resources that will come to our community. And so it's not only the girls that suffer. Um, this is a 14-year-old girl whose, whose child is in the ICU. Um, because a lot of the times, their bodies just aren't big enough to give birth. Um, and so even though they've reached puberty, their hips are still too small sometimes. And a lot of times, they have, pre -pu uh, um, they have uh, premature births. And so that's what we found in Paten in Guatemala, is that this was a situation where it was starting to get better. They had a hospital there. They had an adolescent pregnancy um, clinic. So we're seeing things, these things are moving in the right direction, but it's still happening because there's not enough education and, and awareness on, on the grassroots level of what needed to happen. So um, my story that I did on the polygamous community in Utah actually started with, um, with the news that there was a raid on their, the uh, ranch, the FLDS ranch in Texas, and I was living in Beirut, and I went over there to cover it because I knew that there was um, a lot of there was a lot. Of, there was sus it was suspected that there were a lot of underage brides, and so this is Vita Keat. She is 19 in this picture, but she has um, a two-year-old daughter, and she was one of Warren Jeff's wives, and he was the like the leader of the organization of the organization, and um, and so. You know, so I, I started to photograph even that community, and um, you're starting to see more conversations come out now about, um, about child marriage in the U.S. And in fact, the U.S. doesn't actually have, um, you know, a, a, like a federal legal age of marriage. It's actually done on the state level, so it goes all over the, um, it goes all over the, uh, the gamut of what age is appropriate for marriage. Um, it's a longer conversation, but it's something that I have continued to watch and, and work on uh, in bits and pieces. And so this is Warren Jeffs going to jail, as he should have. Not my best picture, but I had to put it in there. <laughs> and so, um, so then what happened is I wanted to, um, now that I had a lot of these photographs, I wanted to say, what do we do with this? Like, I wanted more to happen because I felt it was so urgent. And um, I was able to, pu to partner with the UN Population Fund, and, and they got um, this billboard in Times Square that we put together, which was pretty amazing. And this was in celebration of the first International Day of the Girl in 2012, and that's why this happened. And, um, and it was one of those things that, that I was very, it was the start of, a, I think, what, we, what has become a pretty significant movement. And, um, and so my, my, this project has now been and at the time, it really focusing on a lot of the, trying to address the urgency because every two seconds a girl is married. Um, that, those are the statistics. And, um, and so we were kind of doing the advocacy level, uh, ag advocacy um, angle first with politicians. This is in the US Senate rotunda. But the exhibition actually went to many, um, many countries and went to about 15 countries where there were high rates of child marriage as well and that was in partnership with the Canadian government. This is Archbishop Tutu. He was one of the leaders of the movement, the early part of the movement in 2012, and really calling on church, uh, religious leaders to not um, have this be, this wasn't about religion, this was about respecting each other. And then I did a project on um, champions in, uh, in different parts of Africa who were working on this issue um, with the help of the African Union. Um, we pulled together different traditional elders, traditional leaders, um, activists, NGO workers, um, and even uh, members of uh, the political parties to, to be able, who are standing up, about, uh, up against this issue and really trying to show that change needed to happen. Which brings me to my next um, piece. 
So this, my, my latest project was in northern Nigeria, and it's um, looking, I wanted to see where, the, where t there's been a lot of movement on the issue in the last 15 years, and I'm very grateful for that. We're actually seeing rates of child marriage decline now. Um, we're seeing that UNICEF just released a report about that. But the areas where girls are still the most vulnerable are in um, areas where there's crises, humanitarian crises, like conflicts and natural disasters and things like that. So um, this is Yakaka in the middle and her two sisters, and they were all abducted by Boko Haram. And then um, we had here uh, this, you know, a lot of people first started hearing about the girls uh, the, uh, from the Chibuk school girls. And, and this, is a, this is just a school letting out in, um, in Maiduguri. But that was kind of the main thing. And people thought that those girls being abducted by Boko Haram was really kind of the worst of what was happening there. But as I interviewed all of these girls for this project, what I realized is that girls were being used as really recruiting, in, uh, recruiting tools for fighters. If you, if you join our ranks, we're gonna give you this beautiful wife and you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to you know, have lots of children and all these kinds of things. So, um, so this is Hawa uh, and um, this is Balkisu. Uh, this is Hassana and Husseina. So these two girls were abducted at 11 years old, and they already had fistulas when I met them, which meant that they were like leaking urine. Um, and and they, we couldn't put them in school. Um, so what we ended up doing, so I should back up a little. So at some point, it became very difficult for me to continue to photograph all of these in, in hopes that there would be something that people would come to these communities. And I would return to these communities and I would see that like, well, there was a program in the capital city that would do something, but it's nowhere near the rural areas where this was happening. And I would return to these communities year after year and I would see that just wasn't enough programming. And so, um, so then I, I was able to start Too Young to Wed with my friend and colleague, Christina Piaia. And she helped, she did, she's a lawyer, she put together kind of, the back end of it, and um, and we started raising, and then the other thing that happened is it was harder, because the attention, the issue had gotten so much attention, um, and it was also hard to get um, funding for any, but like, it, it had gotten a lot of attention, but at the same time, the industry was kind of crashing, and it was very financially, and it was very hard to get funding to do these long-term projects, because it's the access is hard, and it's very hard to get people you know, to do this project in three days is not going to happen. <laughs> and, so, and so it became impossible to continue the work without support. So we started Too Young to Wed to continue providing visual evidence of what this looks like for girls around the world, but to also support the girls in the photographs. Because ultimately, they want help, and they deserve it. They're sharing their stories with the world, and the least we can do is try to give back to them. Um, so we have a program now. Um, all of these girls have the worst stories, and I'm going to show. I'm going to show you a film after this. But um, all of these girls in our program and in, in this program now are in schools. We have leadership um, scholarships that we give. Um, Dada actually didn't want to go back to school. She's 14. She's 14, and this is her like two-year-old or one and a half-year-old child. And she told me one of the things she told me. She said, "I said, weren't you afraid to escape?" And she said, I was a living ghost. I had nothing to lose. <coughs> and she left with her baby. And so she didn't want to go back to school um, because she, she spoke French and she had this baby and there wasn't a place to do that, but she wanted to start her own business. So we gave her some funding to um, start her own business and she hired three other survivors, all did the same thing to work with her. And so um, the next thing we did was, um, we decided to take it to the next level. And you know, when we published a story, the Child by Mother Nigeria story, the, um, it was like we had the Trump Muslim ban happen that weekend and it just didn't get the attention it needed. And so I, what I wanted to do, I, I, went to, I took the work and I went to meet with some um, lawmakers in DC and they said, well, if you can bring the girls here, maybe that'll help. So we did. And here's a short film about it.
It's for you. How is everything? How are you? How are you? How are you? Did okay? But you made it. We have made it, honestly. conversation about yeah. what we're going to do for the day, who they're going to meet, yes. why they're, what they can possibly do, what mm -hmm. their role is. I think you're going to find that there's going to be a lot of love coming towards them. A lot of compassion and love is coming their way. But the main thing is that people just don't know um, what, that there's so many girls missing and that there's not resources for them when they leave. And they need to know to be able to help. Yeah, stories will bring uh, help to those girls. Please know that we're going to also have a lot of fun <laughs> while we're here. We're going to go see, go sightseeing, we're going to go shopping, we're going to go have a lot of fun. I love you, sir. conversation so people can hear a little bit about what life was like in Bama before Boko Haram entered their town. Uh, to the escape and getting to my degree, it was six months. Yara and Nikide Abu Bon. To me, Saki Kayipo Kaliki Gudu. But you are Aba. Aba Mohala Awaja. Come on, Nami. Baba Samuwa is a shame. Baba Ching Awaji. Everybody had the right to rape you at any time. So life was becoming too unbearable for her. She decided to leave. I just want them to know that we would never, ever, ever, ever have them here and have them talk about this over and over if we didn't truly believe it could help. Go find the entrance. 
I personally believe that child marriage is one of the worst violence against women. Because when you force a girl to marry, you've given someone the right to rape them over and over again. You've subjected her to a life of planned poverty because you've ruined her education. You've ruined her economic opportunities. You've made her a mother when she wasn't ready to be that. And now she becomes a caretaker with no future in sight. The solutions have to be driven by members of the community, especially women who are directly impacted by these issues. What advice would you give to young women who are just starting out on the advocacy road? I think when you come out, make sure you have a right support system by you. When you join this journey, you are going to lose members of your family, you are going to lose friends, you are going to be an outcast in your own community, but it pays off and there's light at the end of the tunnel. You have to remember this is now no longer about you or your immediate family. This is about a lot of people. Millions of girls go through child marriage every day. Take care of yourself and find a circle of support. I'm almost, I'm speechless on the unspeakable violating of these two beautiful girls. We need to approach the Nigerian government again. Thank you for sharing your story and just know we're going to do everything we can do, everything, to make sure that not only your lives move forward, but we also want to make sure that all of the girls have that same chance. And so we have a chance here in Congress to put the United States on the right side of history. You two are very courageous. We honor you and we have deep respect and love for you. And we are so sorry that you had to have the experiences that you had. We already know that you are brave and courageous. Go on and be the best you can in your space. You will help others and we'll help you. God bless you.
Thank you. There's more. <laughs> thank you. I'm not quite done, but thank you. Um, so, um, so that was like just last month. <laughs> so I'm a little tired still from that. They were actually here 16 days, uh, not here, but in the U.S. for 16 days. They met um, with. Um, not only did they meet with members of U.S. Congress. Um, but they also met with, um, they were on a few panels at the Commission on the Status of Women at the United Nations. They met with UNICEF headquarters, UNFPA headquarters, and we're actually trying to build a program now um, with UNFPA, hopefully that will go through, that we will start being able to trace some more of these girls that are without services outside of the camps. Um, and uh, if all goes well, I, we've had, um, a lot of support from, um, the nice part about running an, an NGO is you get to kind of collaborate with a lot of amazing people. And so um, we have a law firm that's helped us draft a resolution um, that we proposed along with the girls' visit to provide survivor services, psycho psychosocial support, um, and, and funding for these programs. I mean, that's really what we want. We want funding that's more than our small NGO could do, but like bigger funding and, and really even diplomatic pressure to use um, to pressure to start pr protecting these girls who, um, who are in these very, very vulnerable situations. And, the, and it's actually been accepted by, um, se by Senator Durbin's office and uh, Representative Wilson's office and Congresswoman, um, I mean, sorry, Senator Collins, who's actually a Republican, it was a bipartisan meeting with the senators and, um, and in the House. And they're, they've accepted the resolution and they're gonna be hopefully announcing it in the coming days. So that's what's happened from their visit. Thank you. Um, and, um, but obviously this is because of these beautiful, very, very strong girls. And, um, and how, how was 17 and Yakka just turned 19. And, um, and the research shows that um, what needs to happen is actually um, that the best way to fight this stuff is to have program support, but it's actually to empower girls as well um, on the ground, on the grassroots level. If you can empower these girls, then they're the ones that this is happening to. If they can bring them in spaces that they're close and they're, they're, they're not isolated, then they're their best advocates. And so this is actually a program um, in Sierra Leone that is um, educating girls. They're still going through a lot of the beautiful parts of the culture that celebrate um, rites of passage and things like that. But then they also, if, they, if the families agree not to cut the girls, then um, they get free tuition. So that's kind of how that works in that situation. And these are some of the programs, these are not our programs, but these are some of the ones that like, this type of awareness raising can help inspire. And these were shot for National Geographic. Um, this is a 13-year-old, 15-year-old girl who are part of a, um, who one of them's already married, but they're, they're part of a, these girl clubs that are hopefully, are starting to come up in different places where just girls are able to come together and, and learn where, who outside of your family is someone you can trust? Where is the police station? How, to, if, if something happens to you, who do you contact? How do you have a bank account? How do you have savings? Like just general practical stuff that, that to keep them more independent and safe. Um, this is a program, uh, it also in Sierra Leone, um, that is with, you know, as this awareness continues, this is a fistula repair organization. And, uh, and this is the first time at Aberdeen Women's Clinic and they, um, this is the first time she had ever, when you have fistulas, your, your muscles and your legs drop. And so her feet, when she would walk, she would kind of do this and that slow her down just physically, not even just and so this is the first time she was able to walk with and li normally. And so she needs another surgery, but like this, the giving back and rebuilding some of these survivors is so important. This is a program in India where um, they have, you know, they have football, soccer, however you want to call it. And, um, and of course, everyone wanted to join, mostly the boys. And they said, okay, for every five girls you bring to the program to learn football, and have them in school, then we then um, a boy can join. So those types of things kind of continue the the cycle. And then this is a um, this is a really uh, beautiful woman named Ritu, and I met her. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the violent things that happens towards women um, is our acid attacks that many of you know about. And um, Ritu was proposed to be married, and she. Um, 
and she said she didn't want to do it. She was a star volleyball player, and so she, um, she refused her marriage, and um, he threw acid on her. If, like, if I can't have her, nobody can. And so, um, but she, with a, a group called the Acid Survivors Foundation, um, they have a, a, a cafe where they have girls teach, um, you know, they have girls teach about, the, a ra a raise awareness about the issue of acid attacks um, in a cafe that's right near the Taj Mahal. So they can kind of continue educating people and get funding to support these girls. And, um, and so I just wanted, um, and one of the things I really liked about this picture in this moment, it was one of those times when you're, you're like, it was raining, it was monsoon season, the cafe was closed, and so I was just hanging out at their house, and she was like, and it's pretty intense, you know, hearing these stories, and you just love them, and you, your heart breaks, and, and she's like, you want to go take a bath on the roof? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and she was like, we just went up there, and she was just bathing in the water, and just letting, like, the nature just, like, cleanse, like, all of this, and her strength in that. And it just shows how, how important rebuilding and people and girls is. And so I'm going to show you a film next, and then I'm, that's it. Um, and then I'll take some questions. But um, we're hoping to work with her and this organization as one of our future um, programs. So this is, I'm going to, this is one of the things we do. Um, I'm going to show a film, and it's going to be kind of the, the other thing we're doing at Too Young to Wed to help work um, on a lot of these issues. Every two seconds, a girl is married around the world. Child marriage has many significant harmful repercussions. The most important being it perpetuates the cycle of poverty. Girls are taken out of school, and if they're forced to give birth at very young ages, often their lives are in jeopardy. We've rescued about a thousand girls, but we are sponsoring 315 to go to schools. I'm going to go to school. 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 I'm going this is the second year we're running the Tahani Photo Workshop in conjunction with the Samburu Girls Foundation here in Northern Kenya. All of the girls attending this workshop are either former child brides or have escaped early marriages. This workshop is about photography, but only as a tool. It's really about your voice and how important it is that the world hears what you have to say. The workshop is built to work on several levels. It's meant to strengthen community bonds. It's meant to build leadership skills. It's meant to be able to help girls process the unspeakable trauma that they've endured. It's an incredible opportunity for the girls to channel their complex emotions into their photography, using it as a tool of self-expression and therapy. The photography is a different angle and it's unique because it brings the word out to the bigger world. Some of them even go back to the village and try to use that information to rescue their own sisters and neighbors. Before this workshop, I was afraid to talk in front of people and to share my story, but now I have that courage to lead people. I think there's a big difference between the girls who went through the photography program and the other girls. Hey. <laughs> they look different, they sound different, they are, you know, there's more confidence. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
We have a community exhibition at the end, which is an opportunity for the girls themselves to advocate to protect girls' rights. It's still that lack of understanding by the community of exactly what they should do at this point, because while well, they've had it wrong, but to them it's been a, a, a culture for so many years. Girls can do anything. That's This workshop is in honor of all the girls who remain in marriages around the world and cannot escape. My name is Immaculate. My name is Master. My name is Mary. Susan. Jacqueline. Selena. Angela. Monica. My name is Eunice. My name is Lynette. It's Marcy. Silvana. Rosilla. My name is Evany. Lashaki. Modesta. My name is Anita. My name is Jen. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.